Well, hello and welcome everybody. I see that we are all coming into the room right now so that um, everybody is uh, joining us and welcome. I wanna thank you all for joining us. I see, I just chatted and asked everybody where you're from and it seems like we have the whole world represented right now. So thanks for joining us on this. Um, I wanna thank you all and tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Mara Walsh and I am your host for today. We have a really large group online and it is, it is um, growing as we speak. I'm happy to see all of you here. I'm just gonna take our slide off of the join slide and make sure that you all understand the audio aspects of this tour, just so everybody is um, prepared and ready to go. Okay, so I see a lot of you people are joining us virtually, and I know a ton of you are still, are still trying to get on. Um, I see some people that I know and a lot that I don't know, and I see some of you that I've even traveled on physical tours with in the past, so welcome back. Um, first, a few housekeeping items. Your audio, if, you're, if you need to turn your audio, you can do this um, one of three ways to improve your audio connection. One, you can attach a headset or earbuds. This is the best way to hear on any device. You can turn your computer audio up if needed. You can also go to the little arrow next to your mute microphone icon on the Zoom menu and go to the audio settings and turn up the audio volume for your speakers here. Let's talk about the screen. In order to enlarge the presentation screen, you can do that by moving the vertical toolbar to the right to make my video as small as possible and the slide as large as possible. That will really help you um, during the tour. Okay, now we should all be optimized for the best viewing results. I'm gonna share a little bit about myself for those of you who are new to these virtual tours. Again, my name is Mara Walsh. I'm in the United States and specifically between Philadelphia and New York, so that is the Eastern time zone. It is five o'clock uh, p.m. here. I started leading um, tours with EF Tours as a Girl Scout leader, taking girls and their families on tours every summer. And I have since expanded my travel program and added adult-only tours to my, um, to my list of tours. And I have also included family-friendly tours. In nearly all of my tours, I partner with EF Tours or with their adult division, Go Ahead Tours. There's a couple reasons I started this virtual tour series. Um, one, I really wanted to support the tour director community during this time of no work since we're not able to travel. And two, I really wanted to keep the excitement of travel alive for my travel group and extend that opportunity to those who have learned about our tours through friends and family and social media and other means. Um, it, this program has really grown over the course of the last three months, so I'm thrilled that all of you have found us and that you're enjoying the tours that we're offering. We've done several tours in the past weeks, including Rome, Edinburgh, Paris, London, Peru, Ireland, Greece, Ecuador, Prague, Egypt, and a literary tour through the UK and Russia. I know that many of you have joined us for some of them, but if you missed any of them, all of them are recorded and available on girltraveltours.com. I believe the website is, yes, the website's on the slide. And also uh, there's a drop down menu for virtual tours. You can just click on virtual tours and you can um, access any of the ones that have been recorded as well as the ones that are in the past. We have several more tours um, that we're working on, including China, the Amalfi Coast, New Zealand, an African safari, um, Germany, Japan, the, highlights of, the highlands of Scotland, Alaska, Australia, and more to come. As long as you're interested in viewing these tours, we will continue to produce them with all of my um, colleagues out there in the world that are tour directors. Um, we really, we, we really are, are just thrilled to bring you these tours. Um, you can register for future tours and view all the recorded tours, but today we are off to Madrid to tour the Prado Museum. Before we get going, I want to share with you a few ways for you to interact with us during this event. One, 
feel free to answer questions, uh, ask us questions about the tour, the tour director, or my travel program by using the Q&A link in the Zoom toolbar. You will have a Q&A session after the tour, so feel free to add your questions as we go along. The Q&A tool is really questions for Manuel, the tour director, that you want us to read aloud at the end of the tour. The chat is for more private communications back and forth to me or, um, or things that aren't necessarily going to be managed during the Q&A portion, okay? Um, I always like to include an interactive poll so we can see how familiar everybody is with this region and specifically with um, these exhibitions. In fact, um, let's do that right now. I'm gonna launch the poll uh, for you all to become a part of this um, interactivity. And the question is, how well do you know Madrid and the Prado Museum? I've been in love it. I have a trip booked. I plan to go in the future or I am solely interested in experiencing it virtually. So I'm going to let a decent amount of our participants um, come on and answer that. If you can't see the poll, you can go to the three little dots at the bottom of your, your Zoom toolbar and click on it and you'll find the poll um, there. So I'll give you a minute to find it before we start uh, talking about it. But ultimately, um, we have about one third of our participants who've been and loved it. And we have another almost 50% or so that can't wait to go in the future. So I'm gonna end this poll. I'm gonna share the results so that everybody can see them. And you can see that many people, um, there's about 25% of people out there that are here solely for our, our virtual tour, so welcome. And then um, all you other travel enthusiasts that um, have your suitcases packed that are ready to go as soon as, uh, as, soon as we're allowed, um, I'll be right there with you, quite honestly. Okay, so regardless of how much we all know about the museum at this point, I know that our knowledge will be enhanced through the, this virtual tour. Um, a tour would not be complete without a fantastic tour director. A tour director is like a personal travel concierge who stays with your group from start to finish and shares a world of knowledge, manages all your travel plans and makes sure your experience is stressless and full of positive experiences along the way. So these are by far the most important people in your group. And if we're not traveling, obviously these tour guides and tour directors are not working. So I'll share with you via chat and during the Q&A how you can tip the tour director if you're inclined. And um, I just wanted to mention that 100% of the tips do go directly to the tour director once they're collected. I'm hoping that this virtual tour not only reignites your desire to travel, but allows a tour director to do what he does best, which is share his knowledge and passion for travel. And we're lucky today to have a one of Spain's finest tour directors who happens to be an expert in art and the Prado Museum. I'm honored to introduce you to and hand over this event to our amazing tour director, Manuel Alberta. So Manuel, if you wanna take yourself off of video, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. You're gonna come on. And hopefully I'm gonna unmute you and get you going. And I'm gonna hand it off to you, Manuel, so it's all yours. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm really, really glad to, to start with this virtual tour. It's gonna to be my first time. Uh, as uh, Mara um, uh, um, tell you, told you, I'm a tour director, uh, in particular experience and working with EF groups uh, and other companies. And um, I wanna thank you for the introduction you made about our job. I'm missing, I'm missing uh, terribly working with groups and people, but it's not possible these days. So we are managing in another, in another way. So uh, hello and greetings from Madrid. Here is uh, pretty late, it's nice. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you because I've seen that we have people from all over the world, okay? So let's start with the, with the, with the presentation. We are going to visit the Prado and the area surrounding this beautiful museum. Let me, let me go over there, okay? I'm going to share my, my screen now, so we are going to start with the presentation.
Okay. Here we go. So I put this title, Madrid and the Paddy Museum Reunited, because this is the name of this exhibition that uh, the, the museum opened after the uh, lockdown. Okay. So I want to invite you to Spain first. Some of you uh, wrote over there that you've been visiting Madrid or some other in Spain, but in general, for everyone, here we have the Iberian Peninsula. We are in the south of Europe. We have the Portuguese, our neighbors, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean, France in the north, Morocco and Africa in the south. You have here a representation of our monuments and landmarks, and also, also our uh, nice and delicious food. For instance, very briefly, we have the delicious paella in the Mediterranean coast. I hope you have tried. The Iberian ham, also very famous. The flamenco dancers, the matadores. We have in the north the seafood. The Cathedral of Santiago of Compostela, the end of the way of St. James. Also, we have another beautiful city in the north called Bilbao with the Guggenheim Museum. Very near to Bilbao, we have the running of the bulls. Well, you have read Hemingway's Fiesta. It's all about that celebration. And uh, uh, we have also Barcelona to the northeast uh, by the Mediterranean with the magnificent buildings of Antoni Gaudí, like the Sagrada Familia. And Madrid, we are just in the middle of the country. It's represented here with a commemorial uh, gate, Puerta de Alcalá. So that's my city. I live here since I was one year old. I was born in fact, uh, I was born in fact in La Mancha, the land of Don Quixote, but my parents moved here later on. So once we are in Madrid, let me show you the city center. Okay. So we have different neighbors over there. And uh, the meeting point, the, the place to be in, in, in when you are in the city center is Puerta del Sol. I put a red circle uh, in the middle. Another important area of the city is the Royal Palace to the, to the, to the west. But the area where I want to visit is the, the one known as Prado and Retiro. Okay, it's the one I put in a circle, in a purple circle. And also I mark in green the Paseo del Prado, the Prado Prominate. Okay, in blue you have uh, marked the Museo del Prado, the Prado Museum. So this is the area uh, that we are going to visit because this area is intended to be, you know, a World Heritage Site. It's now a candidate for that, with that name, Prado and Retiro Landscape of Art and Science. So let's, let's take a look of, of this beautiful area. In fact, it was created uh, originally uh, 400 years ago. Uh, the king, the queen, the people with the power in the, in the nation, they decided to create this area to to you know, to enjoy natural science, art, to walk, to see and being seen with beautiful gardens and fountains. This is the Retiro Park. It was a beautiful area that we love to, to come to during the weekends, in our holidays. It's like the whole of all Madridians. We live there when we have the time to do it. The Retiro Park, in fact, was part of a beautiful um, um, palace the Palace of the Buen Retiro, the Good Retirement in the Golden Age. So all the culture and main events happened there. Later on, in the Enlightenment uh, era, in the 1700s, uh, the new dynasty, the Bourbons, decided to, to design a, a promenade, which is the Prado, with uh, buildings dedicated to the science and the arts, like the Prado Museum, the Astronomical Observatory, and also the Royal Botanical Gardens. The idea was so successful that was copied in different cities in the Spanish colonies, like in Mexico, in Lima, uh, or in La Habana. In this area, we have three of the most important museums that we have in Madrid and also in, in the world, like the Prado Museum for the Classical, the Reina Sofia, and the Tizen Born and Mitzan. Also, very important institutions like the Congress of the Deputies, the Royal Academy of the Language, and uh, also the Bank of Spain. It's an area for uh, citizens. We live here, we celebrate, we demonstrate, we enjoy life, culture, as science. So it's the 
area where we love to be in the middle of the city since 400 years ago till nowadays. That is the area that the city of Madrid and the region of Madrid wants to be declared as UNESCO World Heritage. Okay? So in this area is what is located, the Prado Museum. Okay? The Prado Museum uh, we are going to visit now. So I'm going to give you like a little introduction about the museum first, and then we'll continue with the collection with this reunited exhibition. The Prado Museum was originally, this is the building, ori originally created as a science museum in this complex together with the Royal Botanical Gardens. That was at the end of the 1700s. Later on, in the beginning of the 1800s, uh, the king uh, decided to put here the Royal Collection of Art, and that was the origin of the museum. It was opened in 18. 19. So last year we celebrated the 200th anniversary of the museum. The Royal Collection of Art was the, the paintings that were collected, collected by all kings and queens along the history since the Catholic monarchs till that moment. Later on, other acquisitions and donations and other pieces of art from different monasteries, convents, palaces were included in the museum, okay, till now. And that we have one of the most important collections in the world. Probably it's not the most important museum about the number of, of pieces, but probably it's for sure one of the most important because of the quality of uh, the masterpieces that we have inside. Um, in particular, if you want to study the Spanish school from the Middle Ages to the early 20th century, you need to come to the museum. You need to uh, look at the paintings of uh, Velázquez, of Goya, El Greco, but also we have very good representation of Flemish school like Jordi Bosch, Rubens, Van Dyck, and the uh, Italians like Raphael, Titian, and many others. Okay, this is the place to be if you want to enjoy art. The museum was extended in the 2007 with another building, and Norman Foster, uh, is gonna have designed the new enlargement that's gonna happen in the, in the next year. They want to take another building uh, near to the Prado Museum to, to make it bigger, to have more, more exhibitions room because only a part of the paintings are on display. About 1,300 paintings out, out, out of um, 9,000 more or less. But in total with the sculpture, drawings and, and prints, they have 20,000 pieces of art in the museum, okay? So the museum was closed during almost uh, three months till from March to June, and it was reopened in June with this exhibition. Uh, I, 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 I'm glad to show you, okay? So let's go to the exhibition. The exhibition was named as Reunited, okay? because what they have done is to put together the main masterpieces from the museum in only one floor, the first floor, the main gallery, and some of the adjacent rooms. So it's a way to avoid, you know, the um, interaction in between the visitors. So they need to follow an itinerary. I want to show you now. This is the main gallery, as you could see to the left. So from the first floor, they need to get into the museum, and follow the different rooms till the end where they have the exit from the north part to the south part of the museum. And so this is the, the United Exhibition. The Museo de Prado as was shown as never was shown before eh, after this month's, this, uh, this month's uh, close. Um, you could read about that that is like a perfume eh, with all its essence concentrated, okay? Only a quarter of the whole museum is, uh, is available in the Central Gallery, as I told you. But it's very curious because, you know, this is pretty much the display that they had at the beginning in 1819 when it opened. Eh? So it's kind of a, a connection eh, on that. They have um, put in this exhibition about 250 uh, masterpieces in a chronological order, as you could see over there from the 15th to the early 20th century. And it's very interesting because they, they, they put 
they had put uh, together some uh, pieces from different authors to make like a, um, you know, a connection, a dialogue in between them, in between the artists and also through the time. Yeah? Um, well, this is the, 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 the exhibition I want to show you. And first, when you come into the museum, you are going to be in a hall where you have this a sculpture that you could see here to the right. That is a sculpture dedicated to Charles V, emperor and king of Spain. Uh, and it's very interesting because this sculpture made by the Leoni brothers, um, in fact, are two sculptures in one. In here, you could see the king with the furi, uh, the uh, victor over, 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 the, over, over the, the furi, and he's naked as a, a Roman or Greek god. But in fact, normally, we only could see this piece with an armor, with another part of the sculpture that you could see here. See, this is how we normally see the sculpture when we get into the museum. But for this exhibition only, they have removed the armor, okay? So you could see the king naked. I'm not sure if he had that spectacular body, but you know, he was the king, right? So he, he decided. Okay, so let's go. Let's go. Start it with the with the with the exhibition that I I I decided to divide in three parts. Okay, so the first part is going to be from the beginning, room number one, to the room number six, the first part of the main gallery, and also some of the rooms uh, behind. Okay, we are going to have here uh, Italian and Flemish schools from the 15th century, for instance, Frangelico and Baden, also German school with Durer, and later on in the room number two, we have Bos, Patini, Raphael, Correggio, uh, later in the three, Caravaggio and San Still Lives. We'll get into the room number four, one of the most important artists, El Greco, and some other uh, portraits. Rivera, Zurbarán, Spanish, very important artists from the Barroco, and at the end, we'll see the Venetian school with Tintoretto and Veronese. Okay, let's go start it. In the first room, you are going to see opposite one to the other one, uh, Frangelico and Roger van der Weyden. Okay, these two artists and styles represent the two most important traditions of European uh, um, art uh, at the beginning of the Renaissance. Uh, we are talking about the Quattrocento, uh, you can see, uh, 1426. In fact, this beautiful painting from uh, Frangelico was in between the Gothic art and the new Re Renaissance movement. What is from the Gothic art? What? This golden, golden, uh, golden um, part of the, of, the, of, of the painting, and also the perspective are not really get there, okay? He, he, this is not really well done, but they are starting with, with that. If you uh, uh, look closely, there's a room at the, at the, at the back uh, with a little window. So that is the beginning of the perspective that really on the Renaissance and the, and the, and the other paintings, uh, they work better, okay? is the annunciation of the Archangel San Gabriel to the, to the Virgin Mary about, the, 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 about Jesus Christ. To the left, we have a scene of the paradise when Adam and Eve are uh, exposed of the paradise, okay? So, so in the other, on the other side, opposite to this uh, painting, making a dialogue with it, with it, we have this exceptional painting from Roger van der Weyden the descendant from the cross. He was um, from the Netherlands, which is now the Netherlands, um, and this is unique because of the size. It's a very big painting, so almost uh, the, 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 the figures are in a, in a real size, okay? It's kind of a sculptural uh, painting. You could feel, you know, like in a sculpture inside the painting. Uh, he's playing with, uh, with beautiful diagonals um, in between, for instance, you know, uh, the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ, and also making, you know, a complex uh, composition with, with all the, the characters, you know, 
making this harmonious you know, uh, painting. Also, the technique with the colors and with the texture of all the clothes is really exceptional. When you get close to the painting, you could almost touch it. It's really, really, really fantastic. But he broke a little bit of the tradition of the Flemish school because normally they made smaller, smaller uh, paintings uh, full of details, but in this, in this case, in a much larger uh, scale. Okay? From that room where we have, you know, uh, Frangelic and Roger van der Bengen, we have also this other artist, Albert Dürer. He was German. We don't have that many German uh, pieces in the museum, but the ones that we have are really good, okay? This is a Renaissance uh, already. And in this um, painter and in these pieces, Adam and Eve, we have the two other traditions, the one from the north, from the Flemish school, and the one from Italy, connected. Because in a way, we have this kind of sculptural and sensual bodies coming from, from the Italian Renaissance. But also we have, you know, the details, the technique that is coming from the Flemish school, okay? Are real size, so are pretty big, and uh, pretty, pretty big uh, uh, pieces and they were restored restor, restor recently, so are really beautiful. We have also in the same room, a portrait of Dürer himself. And he is um, saying, that he's telling to us that being an artist, a painter is something very important. It's not just being an artisan, because at that time, at the time of the Renaissance, they want to be recognized. So that's why he portrait himself as a, a nobleman, okay, uh, saying right, it's written in the in the in the in the window that you know I'm Albert today with 28 years and I'm a painter, okay. So it's also a kind of a, state, a statement of an artist, like an intellectual, not only like an artisan. From here, we are coming into main gallery, and okay, this is an exception I made for you because this, paint, this painting is not in, on the exhibition, eh? because it's, uh, it's very fragile and it's complicated to move, to move the painting from its original room, but it's one of the masterpieces of the Prado. So for those that are thinking of, of visiting us, uh, this is, is gonna be like an introduction or for the other ones that have seen it, you know, uh, I'm sure you will appreciate it. So this is Geronimo's boss also, from the Netherlands, and it's called the Garden of the Early Delights. So, but let's see a little bit closer. It's a triptych, so it's closed, okay? So, when it's closed, we have, you know, the moment of the creation of the paradise. And when it opens, as you can see, we have the three panels of the painting. To the left, we have the paradise with Adam and Eve. To the right, we have the hell, and just in the middle, we have the earth with all the pleasures that we could have, okay? Uh, it's full of details, full of uh, persons, men, women, some black people, fruits and animals, but in, not in the regular scale, you know, are much bigger eh, in a kind of different scale. And the only connection between the hell and, 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 the and the paradise is the scene, okay? So mainly last is represented, but not only that. And it was uh, painted for, for the king and the queen. Uh, we have this rep representation of knights, riders with horses and other kind of fantastical animals, okay? In the hell, we have another of the, of the, of the scenes, like gambling, for instance, that are punished or hearing uh, folk music, secular music. The, uh, the punishment uh, is made with his own instruments, as you can see over there, very, very, very clear. Also, some criticisms to the church eh? because of the behavior with the, with the common people. We have a pig eh, like a nun, okay? So this uh, world that we live is to enjoy life, as you could see in the central panel, and um, love, and luxury, 
pleasures, but it tells us that all of that is ephemeral. All of that is fantastic, but it's ephemeral. In the middle of the lagoon, there is this uh, fountain connected with the paradise with beautiful materials, precious, precious materials, but are broken, okay? So everything that is fantastic, precious, uh, at the end is gonna be broken or it's gonna die. That's the idea, that's the message of this painting. Even when you taste a giant strawberry that you are gonna see here to the left, uh, you are going to uh, enjoy that for only a moment. Eh? So ephemeral is the, the, the key word in this, in this painting. Uh, certainly it's a piece of, uh, of art where you could uh, spend hours eh, with all the details, okay? So that is Geronimo's boss. Just as an, an, an anecdote, um, the King Philip II, he believes in kind of magic portals. So he wanted to have this painting at the moment of his death. So while he was dying, he was looking at this, at this painting, who knows. Then we continue in the Central Gallery with the uh, Italian Renaissance, with Raphael, Raffaello Sanzio. We have another Madonna's uh, and paintings, but I prefer to put this beautiful portrait of a cardinal, okay? They don't know exactly who, who he was, probably the Cardinal Alidosi, a cardinal that, that uh, was working for the Pope Julius II, but it was very, very, very characteristic, you know, the way that Raphael uh, portrayed him. It's like, you know, the, the iconic uh, prince of the church, the cardinals, with that uh, look that uh, reflects the power and ambition of those, uh, of those people, okay? Uh, Raphael took the model of the Mona Lisa uh, uh, to, 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 to paint this, this piece of work. Uh. If you get closer, you could also see the details on the silk of the, of the, of the, of the, of the clothing. Okay? It's really impressive when you are in front of it. It's not very big, but it's that kind of painting like the Mona Lisa. If you look to the eyes and you move yourself from one side to the other, he's looking at you. Uh, not the kind of paper that is really scary sometimes. Yeah. Okay, in this um, uh, room, uh, they have put together these two beautiful paintings making a dialogue, okay? Uh, because in both of them, it's very important the landscape, the colors are very harmonious. It's like you could pass from one to the other. The, the one to the left is from Joaquin Patinil from the Flemish school. school. Charon crossing the sticks. Eh, it's going to the hell to, to meet uh, Cancer Verus, the dog that is protecting the hell. And in the other one, we have uh, 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 Noli Metangere, which means in Latin, don't touch me. Eh? It's the moment when um, Mary Magdalene uh, is seeing Jesus after his resurrection, okay? Uh, from Correggio. Uh, an Italian artist. So uh, along the exhibition, they have made this kind of connection between artists, okay? This is one of the most beautiful, I really like it. And then we are getting into the room number three, one of the, the rooms, um, um, uh, the agents and room, rooms, and we have Caravaggio. It's the only Caravaggio we have in the museum. So it's, we, love, we love this painting in the Prado Museum. Uh, we are at the beginning of the 1600s, which are revolutionary moment, moment from the art. Caravaggio is using the light in a very dramatic way to illuminate uh, their scene. In this case, you know, the body of uh, uh, David uh, and also the head and part of the body of Goliath. Uh, we, we have an idea of how big uh, Goliath was because of that light over the soldiers uh, and the head, okay? Uh, this is a, there was a battle in between, a war in between the Philistines and the, and the, and the Israelites, and uh, this little kid, uh, David, David uh, killed Goliath, a giant, um, throwing a stone with a rope, 
okay? That's the, the history behind, okay? So this um, technique using in a very dramatic way the light to, to, to remark the bodies and the scene it was called tenebrism eh? or chiaroscuro, but chiaroscuro is a little bit different. Tenebrism is this way to use the light to, to, to make more dramatic the, the scene. Eh? In the Baroque, with this coming, in fact, this is the beginning of the Baroque, in particular in Spain, some of the artists, they were following this uh, Caravaggio style. In this same room, that is a room dedicated to, to the touching, to get closer, like Caravaggio, right? with, the, with the head. And here, with these still lives, we have many uh, important, beautiful still lives in the Prado. I've selected just a couple of them. One from a Spanish artist, Juan Sachet Cotan, uh, and one from a um, uh, Dutch, uh, or Flemish, sorry. Flemish uh, artist Clara Peters. Um, in both of them, it's really impressive how they, they copy the natural, they copy the reality. It's almost possible to touch, you know, the, the fruits, the, 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 the game, the flowers, the, the, the candy over there, the, the, the biscuits, okay? And um, in particular, the one of Clara Peters is also very interesting because when you get closer, uh, you could see the face, a portrait of her, of Clara, in every one of the little, you know, um, shiny uh, reflections, okay? Uh, in the Prado, we don't have that many women. Eh? In fact, some years ago, there was an exhibition dedicated to those women that we have in, the women artists that we have in the Prado. Clara Peters was one of them. Eh? So every time I have the chance to put a woman on the exhibitions on, on my explanation, I, I decide to do it, okay? So this is the area dedicated to the still lives. And then we, we, we are getting the room number three, uh, four, sorry, which is the, the one dedicated to El Greco. If you only have a few hours, uh, not that much time to come to the Prado Museum, you need to, to look or to check three artists. One for sure is El Greco, then Velázquez and Goya. If you are only thinking in the Spanish school, the, 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 the much important of our uh, works here. Also Bosque could be another beautiful option. Okay, but El Greco for sure is one of my favorite artists. El Greco, as you could imagine, um, he was an Spanish. He came from, from Crete, from Greek, and he had a very complicated name. I, I wrote it for you over there. Domenicos Teotocopoulos. That was impossible to pronounce for the Spaniards. So, oh, mm, where are you coming from? Uh, from Greece. Oh, okay, so you are going to be the Greek El Greco. Huh? So he, he's the name uh, that he got at the end. Okay. He came to work for the King Philip II, at the time the most important king in the world, the emperor of the Spanish empire at the moment of his major, major splendor. He, he, was, uh, he, he commissioned the construction of the El Escorial, a beautiful palace in the outskirts of Madrid, and many artists from all over the world, they came to, 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 work, with, 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 to work with the king. But the King Philip II didn't like the art of El Greco, okay? Why? Because as you could see here to the left, uh, we have some paintings of, um, of an altarpiece of a convent of Maria de Aragon. They are five, in fact, the Annunciation, the Bathrooms of Christ, the Crucifixion, the Resurrection, and the Pentecost. One of the characteristics of El Greco is he he used, he, he used this, um, these figures that very um, um, enlarged to the, to, the, to the heaven somehow, okay? And very twisted and very complicated uh, position like dramatic scorsos, okay? Like you could see for instance in this painting. Um, this kind of religious painting from the Greco are always divided in two parts, the one to the heaven, the spiritual one, and then the one to the earth. Eh? So you could see over here, the angels over there in the heaven, 
and the Virgin Mary with the Archangel here in the, in the, in the earth. Yeah? It's the same here, Jesus Christ with St. John the Baptist and then all the angels that got in, in the heaven. So the use of the colors, that is also an influence of the Venetian school, uh, was particular in the Greco, uh, but not many people like him. But he was working a lot for convents and religious orders. And so that's why we have many of his paintings in Toledo, because Toledo was the, the, the most important city for, for the church in Spain, with the cathedral and many convents and monasteries. So he was commissioned, commissioned to do many works for, for those institutions. Other of the kind of paintings that Alegreco made while in Toledo, he spent most of his life in Toledo, um, were these portraits of the noblemen. This is probably one of the most important uh, pieces from him, the nobleman with his hand on his chest. Uh, representing, you know, this aristocracy uh, uh, from Toledo. Uh, we don't know exactly who he was, again, uh, but, he, but we do know that he was from the aristocracy because of uh, the black uh, um, dress was very, very expensive to have a black dress at that time. Also because of the sword that he holds. There's a chain, golden chain with a medallion. And also he has, he, he has uh, his hands on the chest, like making an oath. And so all of that tell us that he was a very, very important nobleman in Toledo. He, he made, El Greco made a fortune, you know, uh, with, this, uh, with these portraits. And I also put another painting uh, to the right dedicated to San Sebastian. It's broken because it was part of a, an altarpiece and at the end it was, was removed from that altarpiece. So in this case, it's a, a, a painting made at the end of El Greco's life. So you could appreciate, you know, everything is a little bit more deformed. Eh? It's more twisted. And, and, and the colors are, you know, also more dark in a way. El Greco mm, wasn't really valued till the 19th century, okay? And it was in, in particular very admired by, you know, the artists in the 20th century. Uh, they, they were inspired on, on his, his way of art, uh, kind of manierism uh, at the end. Okay. okay. So in this same room, we have some beautiful uh, portraits, royal uh, portraits. Uh, the most important one probably, uh, and one of the most important from the museum, is this dedicated to, the Mary, to Mary Tudor, Queen of England. But uh, I want to tell you that he was also a uh, wife of Philip II, was the second wife of Philip II, okay? He, she died, okay? But if for any, any, any chance, they have had a, a child, probably the history of Europe, of Europe, or probably the history of the world, you know, were different, okay? The Spanish Empire together with England, probably the history uh, was different. We didn't, we then lost our invincible armada that wasn't invincible at the end, right? Okay, this portrait reflects, you know, the power, uh, the power of a, of a queen. We have the red rose of the Tudors, we have, you know, the beautiful silk and some, some uh, beautiful materials of the, of the clothes, the, the fantastic uh, chair that tell us, you know, all, the, all uh, this imposing figure uh, that was married to her. Also, I added uh, also other painting from a, 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 an artist, a women artist, Sofanisma Anguizola, that is also a portrait of one of the um, wives of Philip II, the third, wife, Isabel de Valois. And in this same area, we have uh, uh, two very important artists from the rock in Spain. Uh, Giuseppe de Rivera is known as El Españoleto because he was living in, in, in Naples uh, during part of his life. So Españoleto, the one from Spain, and Francisco de Zurbarán. Okay? Both of them, they were specialized in religious um, um, works. In particular, Rivera uh, made a lot of uh, paintings about the martyrdom of different uh, saints, like in this case, in this case, Saint Philip. 
and Thurbaran, he, he, he made iconic um, portraits from different religious figures, like in this case, St. Francis. Both of them originally were very influenced by Caravaggio, but at the end, they were adding, you know, these beautiful colors, uh, also an influence from the Italians, but in this case, from the Venetian school. So they make together this kind of combination, uh, coming from the Tenebrism to this uh, uh, more um, um, light uh, uh, atmosphere, okay? So from this two, we are now uh, uh, getting back to the central gallery, and we have uh, this, uh, enormous painting called The Washing of the Feet from Jacopo Tintoretto. This is part of the Venetian school. Uh, they made a giant uh, piece of art. The fresco wasn't, were, wasn't, were impossible, were impossible in, in, in Venice because of the humidity of the water. So this is beautiful. Was intended to be in a, in a chapel, but in a, in a, in a lateral side. So when you get into the chapel, you need to see the painting from the corner, the right corner, where Jesus is, you know, washing uh, uh, the, the, the feet of some of the disciples, okay? So the perspective that you are gonna have are totally different from the one you have if you see the painting from, from, the, from the front, okay? So it changes dramatically. You know, there's a diagonal, diagonal from the, from the from the right corner, from the bottom right corner, till, you know, the lagoon and the gates that you could see there uh, uh, to the left. Um, there's a little scene of the, of the Last Supper uh, in a room uh, behind uh, Jesus Christ, because in the other side of the chapel in Florence, uh, there was a painting of the, of the, of the dedicated to the, to the Last Supper. So there was a kind of dialogue, a connection in between the two paintings. It's really impressive when you see this painting in the main gallery of, of the Prague. From this same Venetian school, we have another two very important artists, like Paolo Veronese, Venus and Adonis, and uh, Guido Reni, Ipomenes and Atalanta. In both of them, in particular in Veronese, it's a beautiful range of colors, um, uh, bright, uh, very beautiful, uh, orange, blue, purple, green. And, and these are sculptural figures like you could appreciate here in the painting of Guido, Guido Reni. This uh, history of Atalanta is kind of very interesting because uh, Atalanta um, challenged um, the possible husbands to a race, okay? If they win the race, she will marry them, but if not, they will be killed. Okay? But Ipomenes, with the help of Venus, he, um, he won the race because Venus gave him, gave him three golden apples. So he was, he was putting the apples on the way, okay? So uh, uh, Atalanta uh, got uh, distracted and he was able, uh, able to win. So from here, we are going to the uh, second part of the exhibition. Uh, this is like uh, the, the central, uh, the, the middle of the central gallery and also the rooms dedicated to Velázquez. In the central gallery, we have Titian. And uh, also in the second part of the central gallery, we are going to see Rubens, one of the most important artists in the museum and uh, another pieces of Van Dyck and Murillo. So let's start in the room number seven with Tiziano, Tiziano Becchiello in Italian, okay? He was in fact uh, considered the father of the Prado because he, he was working for the royal uh, family, for the, for the Spanish monarchy, in particular for the Emperor Charles V and his son, Philip II. Okay? The Emperor Charles V was the grandson of the Catholic monarchs. Okay? Um, at the time, uh, at that time, uh, the Spanish Empire was on his splendor together later on with Philip II. We got the colonies, the new lands in America, Spain, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, the south of Italy, in some of the territories in Europe. And later on with Philip II, even the Philippines, the Philippines was, uh, they were named after Philip. Okay? So this is, 
uh, the, the context. So Titian came and uh, was painting um, for the king uh, these um, magnificent, you know, portraits of the of the monarchy. Okay, in this case, uh, Emperor Charles V at Mulberg is a portrait of the king Victor after a battle against the Protestants uh, in in Europe, and he's represented as you know an emperor victorious with these purple colors coming from the Roman Empire, from the emperors, with the beautiful armor that you could find in the Royal Palace in Madrid. Also with that lance that represents the power, okay? And in the other side, we have a kind of a severe portrait of his son, Philip II. Also from Titian, like he also made another kind of paintings, we have this kind of more allegoric uh, painting called the glory and the glory was commissioned by the king, uh, Charles V, and he wanted to see this painting at the moment of his death. Because again, this king also believed in kind of um, magic. So he, he thought it was kind of portal at the moment of his death. So you could see the king and the royal family, uh, you know, uh, being presented uh, uh, upon, you know, Jesus uh, at the heaven, okay? So from Titian, we are going to get into the main room of the museum, which is the room number 12 in the museum, the nine in this exhibition, dedicated to uh, Belaque. In fact, all the rooms around are dedicated to Belaque because we have the most extensive collection of art uh, from him. This is the most important uh, piece uh, Las Meninas or the family of Philip IV. We are in the 16, in the middle of the 1600s. Velázquez was from Sevilla, from the south, and he came to Madrid to, to paint for the, for the king and became the most important painter, the painting of the king, okay? So let's take a look of this important uh, piece. It's considered one of the most important in the history of art uh, because of its complexity. It's very big. It's about 10 per nine feet, okay? 10 tall uh, and nine uh, wide. And um, reflects a moment uh, in, the, in, the, in the palace. Uh, they are located in the studio of the artist, most likely, because we have different other um, paintings around. And it's about, you know, the uh, Princess Margarita, the Infanta. Margarita Infanta is the Spanish for princess. Uh, she is surrounded by her servants, the Meninas. Uh, Meninas is a word that comes from the, uh, uh, comes from the Portuguese, uh, meaning like maid of honor, something like that, okay? We have uh, in the middle, the Infanta Margarita, the daughter of the King Philip IV. And then we have these other two ladies uh, around her offering, you know, this um, water and taking care of her. Also in the, in the composition, we have uh, to the right, we're going to see in a moment, these uh, buffons and a dog, okay? I have a very important anecdote uh, with, this, with this painting. I was working in the museum for a while, years ago as a, as a, as a guard uh, with the rooms, okay? And there was an exhibition, there was an exhibition, so the president of Spain at the time, Mr. Ragnar, came to inaugurate the exhibition. So before he came into the room, before, before he came into the, in, into the exhibition, you know, the, the security came into the room with a dog, you know, looking for anything dangerous. So when the dog, the real dog, so the dog in the painting, he tried to, you know, to, to touch the dog, he, he, he jumped. Uh, thanks God, you know, he was retained. Uh, but you know, that was a kind of very <gasps> moment in the museum with all the authorities, the director of the museum, everyone. That was <laughs> kind of very scary. Okay, back to the painting, we have this lady and the other men behind the, the Infanta and the servants, they are the chaperon and the bodyguard at the back, we have the Chamberlain of the Palace, the Aposentador, Juan de Velasco, that brings light to the, to, the, to, the, to the scene, to the room 
opening the, the door. We don't know exactly he's coming to the scene or he's leaving uh, to other part of the palace. And reflected in a mirror at the back, we have the king, Philippe IV, and the queen, uh, Mariana de Austria. There's a controversy uh, in between uh, the specialists and everyone because there's two, we have two versions. There's one version that says that Velázquez was painting the king and the queen. That's why they are reflected on the mirror and the Infanta, they came there over there for their amusement. Or the other version is the king and the queen, they just, you know, step in the room eh, where Velázquez was painting the Infanta. So just speak whatever you want, okay? Velázquez plays um, in a very exceptional way with the light and with the atmosphere of the, of the painting. Uh, for instance, we got light from the lateral window, which is, you know, uh, behind the buffons, and also from the uh, door at the back. So in the middle, we have this kind of shadows, okay? So that, uh, that creates an atmosphere and uh, as a, um, uh, a sensation of depth in the whole space. It's really incredible when you are in front of the painting how you could feel it. Right? You, feel, you could feel that room with the different spaces. The front with the infantas in the middle eh, where, the, where the chaperon and the bodyguard are located and the back eh, with the mirror and the, uh, the aposentado. Okay? There is also a legend eh, linked to this red cross on the chest of Velázquez. That's the red cross of the knights of St. James, a very important um, nobility order in Spain. But it was given to him, to Velázquez, after his death. So he wasn't able to paint it. Uh, the legend says that the king it's himself, the king Philip, you know, painted as an homage to, uh, to all the work that Velázquez made uh, for, for, the, for the royal family. Okay, well, it's kind of a nice legend, right? Okay, from Belakken we have many other painters, uh, paintings, sorry, and I'm gonna show you some of them very briefly. We have those uh, on a horseback. Uh, for instance, Philip IV uh, on a horseback. We have the Prince Baltasar Carlos on a horseback here to the left. And also the Duke of Olivares, he was like the, uh, the prime minister, uh, a guy with a lot of power, okay? To the right, we have another two portraits. One of Queen Mariana de Austria, and then we have another portrait of the Infanta Margarita. But this one uh, wasn't painted by Velázquez. It was painted by uh, Juan Bautista Martínez del Mazo. He was the son-in-law of Velázquez. So there's a, a connection uh, anyway. Okay? So from Velázquez also we have these uh, mythological uh, scenes. The most beautiful for, for, for me is this Vulcan's Forge. It was painted after Velázquez's um, journey to Italy. He traveled to Italy to, 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 to get all the influence of Italian art in Rome. And when he came back, he painted it. It's a, 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 a mythological scene, but what is important is all the naturalism of the body and uh, of what is happening, you know? Uh, the, the, the looks and the, the, the ways they are, you know, uh, working on the, on the, on the forge are really very natural. That is a, is a difference with other kind of mythological scene from other artists. Also, we have another one, the Feast of Bacchus. Eh? Also, those people are real people eh? from the neighborhood, around the palace probably, and we like it took, took them as part of this mythological, you know, scene. And one of the last paintings from Velázquez was the spinners. It's a beautiful um, fable uh, with uh, the, the goddess Minerva and a young lady, Aragne. There was a challenge uh, about who was the, the better um, the spinner, okay? At the end, Aragne won, but Minerva, Minerva, you know, got mad and turned Aragne in a spider, okay? And that's the, the, the legend, very briefly, because I, I, I feel I'm talking too much, so I need to keep going. Also to the right, you have another of the beautiful portraits uh, that Pelaki dedicated to the buffons and the, and the members of the, of, the, of the court, like this pipe I'm gonna show you. In the exhibition are in a beautiful display all together in one room, in one wall, okay? 
And then we are getting to the main gallery, to the second part of the main gallery, where we have mainly Rubens. Rubens was one of the most important artists in Europe at that time, during the 1600s, and he was working also for the royal family. He came to Madrid and he painted a lot of uh, um, works for the decoration of the different palaces. Okay? We have the most extensive collection of Rubens in the Prado Museum. Uh, some of them are a, big, a very big format, like this, of the adoration of the Magi. We are in the Baroque, so there is no space uh, for anything. Everything is full of people, uh, very well dressed. Uh, we have the three magic kings, uh, Gaspar, Baltasar, Melchor. We have the knights, we have the camels, we have the angels, the, the holy family. Um, everyone is there. In fact, even Rubens is on the painting. If you look to the painting to the right, there's a horse and there's a handsome um, um, soldier with a blue uh, dress. So above the soldier, there's Rubens okay, in a kind of dark purple dress. Okay, he painted himself yeah, uh, in this case. But the one I like the most, because it's in my imagination since I was a kid, I was taken with my school to the Prado and with another kids, we, 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 we needed to make like a work about the three graces, okay? This is um, one of the many mythologi mythological uh, paintings from Rubens. In this case, these three graces are, um, are on, the, on the service of Venus, the, the, the goddess of love, and are representing the, the voluptuosity and sensuality of the women at the time of Rubens. Eh? So, well, you know, kind of very different from the, from the model that we have nowadays, right? <laughs> uh, it's said that the one to the left, the, 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 the blondiest one, was the wife of Rubens. In fact, he kept this painting till the, till the end of his life. Eh? Probably that was the reason. And together with this painting in the same room, we have a painting from Titian, okay? Rubens was a very, uh, a very good admirer of Titian, and they met uh, in, 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 in Madrid. Um, so that's why they put together these two paintings. The, the one of Titian is called Danae and the Shower of Gold. Uh, Danae was uh, uh, the daughter of a king of the, of the ancient Greek, and he was, uh, she was locked in a in a in a tower uh, to avoid to avoid to have kids because he said you know the kid uh, of uh, of uh, Danai was intended to dethrone the father, uh, the king. So uh, Zeus uh, came into the scene, you know, transforming a golden sour and took her. And from that union, uh, we got Perseus. Uh, but at the end. Uh, uh, got the, the, the kingdom in this case. Okay? So the, the property uh, was fulfilled. And then in the same room, we have the two other dramatic paintings. This is Saturn devouring a son of his son. Saturn uh, was said, was told that one of his son uh, will dethrone him. Okay? So to avoid that, he decided to eat them all really dramatic, right? So Rubens um, uh, painted, you know, this, uh, this, this uh, story, but also Goya 200 later. Uh, this uh, Saturn of Goya is part of the black paintings that we have also in the museum, and it's an introduction to the next rooms in a few moments about him. So uh, the evolution of the painting is very clear, you know. Goya, at the end of his life, he was really, he used a very free way to express himself eh? uh, with this uh, dramatic uh, esteem of Saturn, okay? And uh, before getting to Goya, we are going to stop uh, in a, an adjacent room dedicated to the Baroque, both in the, in the uh, with the Flemish school, in the Netherlands, and also in Spain. Very different. We have these portraits from Anthony van Dyck, Edmund Porter and Anthony van Dyck. He portrayed himself with this nobleman who commissioned 
the, the, the pizza part, uh, telling us again, like Velázquez or, or like Durer at the beginning, that being an artist is something very important. So it's so important, I have the right to be in the same portrait that uh, this, uh, this person that paid me for, 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 for making the portrait. Um, and on the other side, we have this religious um, painting from Bartolomé Murillo, an artist from the south, from Sevilla, specialized in these beautiful uh, Madonnas uh, with beautiful colors. Uh, it's not particularly my thing, but you like religious painting, Murillo probably is one of your stops in the museum. And from here, we are just finishing in a moment with the exhibition, the last rooms dedicated to Goya, and uh, the art of the 19th century and early 20th century. Goya is probably the most important according to the number of paintings together with Velázquez that we have in the museum. And if you want to know something about Goya, you, you need to come to the Prado. Okay, there, there are Goya in other museums, but you know the most important ones are here in the Prado and in other museums in Madrid too. Okay. So we are going to start with this portrait of the royal family, again, and the family of Charles de Port. Okay. At the moment of the history of Spain, we are in the turning of the 1700s to the 1800s. Um, you know Napoleon? Okay, Napoleon was over there. So in Spain, we are in a very difficult moment. Napoleon was uh, there to invite us. So the royal family, they need to make a statement that they are powerful, they are, they are the connection in between the Spanish Empire, uh, the, the most splendorous Spanish Empire with the Habsburg dynasty, uh, painted by Velázquez, and, uh, uh, and, and his own family. Yeah? That's why there's a connection with Las Meninas. Uh, Las Meninas was a portrait of the royal family somehow. So here we have a portrait of the royal family with all the family, the king, the queen, and all the sons and daughters, even the members of the extended family. Yeah? There is a kind of um, idea of telling, uh, telling the people, okay, we have the right to rule the country. We have the history behind us. The, the painting behind the queen tells us that this uh, was um, um, realized recently. That is the case to Hercules. Hercules is somehow the mythological father of Spain. We have the two pillars of Hercules at the Strait of Gibraltar, for instance. Okay, so there's a connection from the mythology of the mythological Hercules through the Ashworth to the actual family, the family of Charles IV. Okay, well, Napoleon at the end invaded Spain on his way to Portugal. It's get tricky thing. We don't have time to, to tell you that. But, um, well, because of that, we have a war of independence, okay? Or peninsular war, okay? Um, the people of Madrid, on the 2 of May of 1808, uh, start a rebellion, started a rebellion against the troops of Napoleon. In this case was uh, the Mamelukes, uh, troops from Egypt that Napoleon brought to the, to the war. Okay? And as a consequence of that, obviously, Napoleon, uh, uh, Napoleon troops uh, won the rebellion. As a conse consequence of that, we have this other beautiful, uh, dramatic, exceptional painting from Goya called The Executions that happens the next day, the 3rd of May. Okay? It's really impressive how uh, Goya gives the light to the painting with, uh, with this um, light in front of the, of the, of the execution um, soldiers, executor soldiers, and also the white uh, shirt of, the, of, the, of, the, of one of the people that have rebelled, okay? The rest of the people are not really important. The soldiers are no one, are, you know, Napoleon troops no important their faces. It's just the one that I want to execute the hero the hero, Spain, in that case, represented by this guy. And the rest, the scene, there is really nothing that you want to see because you need to look to that hero in the middle of uh, the scene. There's also a connection with the later on black paintings eh, with the colors very dark all over around. Okay? Goya also uh, made beautiful portraits of the aristocracy. 
one of my favorites and one of the most important in the museum, a part of the one of the, of the royal family, is this dedicated to the Duke and Duchess of Asuna and their children. When Goya painted, he was able to, to, to put in the painting, you know, the, the psychology somehow of the, of, the, of the people. And you could notice eh, when, he, when he liked them or not. In this case, he liked them. He was friend of this family. So you could have to say, you know, kind of a love on the, on the, on the, on the way he painted them, okay? And also we have this other very famous painting, probably you have seen it when you came to the Prado, called The Naked Maha. It was a kind of um, uh, uh, homage to the body of the women, to the sensuality. But in this case, with no mythological excuse. It's just the beauty of the body of a woman, as it is. We, Goya, uh, don't need like excuse to, 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 to portray that, because till this moment, that was the excuse, you know, the mythological scenes to paint in female or male nudes. Okay? Later on, this painting was commissioned by uh, Godoy, uh, he was the, like the prime minister, nobody would want, and he was kept in a kind of uh, uh, room with other ones, uh, similar ones. Later on, he made the uh, clothed version of the Maha, but the one, the naked one is much better, okay? And then we are coming to the end, arriving to the 19th century. Uh, we have uh, beautiful paintings of the 19th century in the museum, uh, maybe not the most important of the collections, but really beautiful, like this of um, Madrazo, que es the uh, Countess of Vilches, okay? It's really, I really like mm, her, in fact, okay? Because it's beautiful, and Madrazo was an expert in, 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 you know, in reflecting, you know, all the quality of the materials, of the clothing, the silk, the, the tapestry. Uh, it's really uh, also uh, impressive how he's, she's looking at you. Madrazo was specialized in, in, in making portraits of the, of the nobility at the time. He was very, very famous. He made a lot of money making this kind of portraits. In the other side, in the other hand, we have Soroya with this, you know, already an impressionist or even a post-impressionist some, sometimes, people said, and with all this light coming from the Mediterranean. Yeah? This is uh, Valencia in the Mediterranean coast. These uh, boys are enjoying the beach. Yeah? We have the reflection of the water over the sand and over the bodies of these uh, young uh, boys. So Sorolla was also a very important painter at that time, the end of the 19th century, a beginning of the 20th century. And um, he has, uh, in fact, in Madrid, his own museum just dedicated to his work uh, because it was the, the house where he was living. Very interesting painter if you like that kind of art. And for the end, I chose these two paintings, okay? Uh, the one to the left from Rosa Bonheur, she, she was uh, from Belgium, is called El Cid. Um, it was part of an exhibition dedicated to female women, sorry, to female artists that we have in the, in the museum. And uh, it was a discovery. He was kept in the, in the museum, in uh, uh, storage in the museum. And it's called El Cid, it's a lion because he was very fan about, you know, all animals, in particular um, lions, cats, and panthers, and like that. Um, but the name, El Cid, is connecting with Spain. El Cid was one of our major heroes in the medieval ages, okay? Um, and probably uh, uh, that's the connection we have with this painting in, in, in the exhibition, okay? Um, at the end of the exhibition, the last painting is this from Goya. It's called The Drawing Dog. Also part of the black paintings, okay? It's kind of a modern, even contemporary art, okay? Goya is considered, you know, the father in a, in a way of the contemporary art. Uh, it's almost abstract. Uh, it's a little dog coming from nowhere, looking somewhere, uh, fearing something uh, is said that probably is called 
could be an allegory of the fear of death. Yeah? I don't know, but I really like it, and I I I, I appreciate that is it was selected to 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 close to close the, the exhibition and to connect with the contemporary art. Okay, so this is all. I hope that you have enjoyed. I'm waiting for your for your for your questions uh, in a few moments. Thank you very much for listening. That's awesome. Thank you, Manuel. I know that everybody has enjoyed it. We are seeing so many people come in um, with questions and with comments about it. So, so I thank you for that. And I think that we'll be going to those questions in a minute. Um, Manuel, as I review the end of this, if you could just click on the Q&A tab yourself and start to look at those questions, we'll address them from the top to the bottom. For okay. the attendees, if you have questions and you haven't put them into the Q&A, uh, tool, please type them in now and we will start to address them. Um, you'll see on the slide that I have put up that um, not only am I um, allowing you to uh, give you the information for tipping for Manuel, as you can imagine, Manuel could probably do this tour without a lot of thought and preparation if he was physically taking you through the Prado, but because, you know, he had to prep the slides and come up with all of the information and do the research technology is not um, on the forefront of most of our tour guides because they are on the ground running. So um, let's show our appreciation for his time, effort, and knowledge. Um, as indicated, tipping is optional. Uh, no matter how small or large, um, every tip is appreciated. Uh, as the slide says, you can take a screenshot of the slide, but um, also, I will be sending a follow-up email that you'll get within the next day, and it will have this information in it as well. There are three means to tip, Venmo, PayPal, and credit card. Um, or you can chat me if you, have, if you need another um, means, like if you want to send a check or something of that nature, and I'll help you out with that. Um, Manuel, if you're ready, we can get going on the Q&A and um, start to manage some of these. What I would appreciate you to do please is read the question aloud so that people know what the question is before you answer it. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mara. So I'm going to start now. Uh, first question over here is, what, what, is the, what is the island in the Mediterranean? Oh, that what is uh, Mallorca, are the Balearic Islands, uh, beautiful islands uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, waiting for the tourism, uh, you know, because of the pandemic, we are not receiving that many tourism. We are a, a country we live uh, from that. So if you have a chance to visit mate, uh, the Balearic, Balearic Islands, Mallorca is really, really beautiful. Um, the next question is, son los colores original? Are colors original? I don't know exactly. Oh, yes, yeah, in the annotation, yes. The colors in the annotation are original, okay? And it was restored recently, so yes, are original. Okay, in the first gallery, what did they now say in near your uh, Eve's right hand? Okay, that is a technique question. I don't remember exactly that. I need to go to, to see, so maybe I could send you the, the, the answer later on. Who, next question. Who died watching the Garden of the, of, the, of the Delights? That was Philip II, the most important of the emperors that we had. Okay. Uh, if the, uh, next question. It doesn't look like we are seeing the original works of art, but Prince of them. It is true. No, what well, this is the original one. I mean, I downloaded from the Prado Museum uh, website. Okay, obviously, are not the original. The original are in the in the in the museum. But are you know, if you get into the Prado in the Prado website, you could down, download it in a very good quality. Eh? So you could see it very 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 well. The nobleman favors you, Manuel. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't think I understand so, that. So Manuel, do you remember the nobleman in the one painting you showed us? And I agree yeah. with this comment that the nobleman and you look look very similar. <laughs> I had a, I had a chuckle on that as well. Okay, well, I need, I need to tell you that I have any novel in my family, nobility in my family. But thank you, thank you so much. Okay, the children of Philip the Fourth look to have mental problems. 
Well, some of them, okay. No Margarita, but you know, at that time, the royal families, they, they, they matched together in between cousins. And so at the end, the one that had really problems was, was sorry, Charles II was the next king in one of the songs. In fact, you know, was the last Habsburg king, okay. Manuel, next question. Manuel, do you remember Las Meninas in the 1970s in a room by itself with a mirror? Well, in the 70s, I was really uh, a little boy. <laughs> I mean, I don't remember. You went into the room and they turned you around and you look at the painting in a mirror. I felt like you were in the painting. Um, I don't think I, I saw that. Um, maybe I was taken to the museum uh, uh, when I was five or ten, but I don't remember that particular uh, display. Uh, but it looks interesting. Next, Rubens was a card painter in the Spanish Netherlands to who? To the Spanish monarchy. The, the Sp uh, to you know the Spanish Netherlands, you know, belonged to the Spanish Empire. Okay, so he was working for the for the royal uh, family. Uh. Next, the Madrazo painting of the woman there looks so different. She's actually looking back at the painter and smiling, almost a flirtatious smile, youthful. Uh, yes, well, in the museum it looks like that. It's, it's true, it's true. You need to be in front of that, okay? Uh, Chris says, thank you, Manuel, for such a wonderful and informative tour of this exhibition at the Prado. I enjoyed very much and hope one day to see these paintings in real life. Come with me, you come, you know, get, get connected with me. What a wonderful opportunity to learn so much in one afternoon from across the Atlantic Ocean, from Long Island, New York. New York, by the way, Chris, is one of my favorite cities, so uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to come back. Then, uh, Tom Kona uh, says, Rubens and Titian, the years of the paintings were 1565 and 1635. Did you say they met each other? Yes, they met. Rubens was, Titian was older, Okay, but they met in a moment in the in the court, or they they got they got uh, introduced themselves. And Ricardo says, if that is only the first floor, what's on the second floor? Well, the museum due the pandemic uh, was open in a uh, in a certain way. Eh? Only the main gallery, and only those rooms around the main gallery. In the real in the normal way, in the first floor we have uh, the Renaissance and uh, mainly the medieval art and the Renaissance. And then we have in the main room, in the gallery, we have the Baroque uh, and Goya. Uh, so it's, the distribution is different. Okay. Sonia says, thank you so much. Your knowledge and details is incredible. Really enjoy your presentation. Gracias, gracias, Sonia. Uh, I, really, I really enjoy, you know, making this presentation for you. Uh, what's my, first, my very first time? Uh, um, Erika, a number of paintings, such as the Boys on the Beach, showed very detailed bodies, but, but non-descript faces. Was this, a, was this a movement in Spanish painting? Well, it, in this case, with Sorolla was part of the um, Impressionism, or post-Impressionism, but he also made some portraits. Eh? Uh, so sometimes he, he was a real portrait with the with with figure, with the with with face. Arlene, how long do you think it will take to reasonable? It will take to reasonable visit the Prado now with the certain exhibit and in the future when life is back to normal. Well, for this exhibition, you wanna look most of the paintings. Probably you will need something like two hours. Okay, if you want you want to go room by room, and if you want to visit the Prado Museum in a regular way, well. You will spend a week, a year, a month, <laughs> depends. But probably two hours, three hours to see the basics is enough. Uh, two hours probably is the best to go to the basics, okay? The basics that are concentrated in the exhibition, as I told you. Does the Prado have any more geronimous books to see? Yes, they, we have many. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, important collections from him. How, Christine says, how old is the oldest piece of art inside? We have uh, Romanesque art uh, from the, I think it's from the 10th and 11th century, frescoes uh, in another part of the museum. Uh, what does the Prado mean? Uh, it's like a, a meadow, basically. It was a meadow outside the city, okay? 
Uh, Mary says, what will you say museum is most famous for? When is the best, and also, when is the best time of the year to visit Madrid in your opinion? Well, the museum is very famous because it concentrates most of the important European uh, schools um, from the medieval ages to the 19th century. In particular, the Spanish school, the Flemish and Italian. And you want to uh, name three or four artists, El Greco, Velázquez, Goya, and Bos, for instance, or even Rubens. Those are the most important. Okay? The best time to come to Madrid, probably spring or autumn, because it's not that hot. Melia, could you comment on the light around the heads of the bosses in the washing of the feet painting? Wondered when that started. Well, that started uh, pretty much in the Gothic times, okay, when they, they put this kind of halo around the figures of the, of the even before, eh? but in particular during the Gothic period. In the painting of Mary of Tudor, what is, the, what, what is she holding in her left hand? Mm, okay, the right is the rose. I think it's a kind of a letter. Um, something probably, I'm not, uh, sorry. Ah. I'm not sure, but I think it's something related with the, with the marriage with Philip II. Eh? Uh, Aaron, why are the people in the paintings naked? Is this just an art style or does it hold greater meaning? Well, most of the time when they were naked uh, is because they were reflecting a mythological uh, esteem. And if you're talking about Geronimo's boss, it's because they are, you know, uh, enjoying the, the pleasure of life, mainly lust, uh, love. And um, will they ever put a mirror in the room again to see Las Marina in 3D? Um, I never seen it, as I told you before, so I don't think so. Which artists, all this says, which artists traveled to other countries and were influenced by artists in the other countries? Well, for instance, Velázquez, he traveled to Italy eh, uh, to get the, all the influence from the from Italian Renaissance. Also, the modern artists like Madrazo or Sorolla, they traveled around Europe. El Greco, he came to Spain, but he stopped in Venice. Okay, yeah, they move around in a way, eh, the most important ones. Susan. What do you think is the reason for Goya's black paintings at that time in Spain or something personal in Goya's life? Well, both, okay? The, he was a witness of a, a war and very terrible times. And also at the end of his life, he became deaf. And so that also affected his, his, his spirit. So both reasons. Brandy. Okay, that's in Spanish. Ojalá si tuviera la oportunidad de ver y escuchar a toda Navidad toda la historia. Oh, he's telling you he, if he will have the chance to see and listen everything in real here in Madrid. Please, Randy, come to Spain. Rosemary, does the museum have handicap accommodations? Yes, they have all kinds of services, uh, wheelchair or sc scooters, everything is, 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 is possible. Terence, this exhibit has, sorry, this exhibit has how many pieces? About 250. And I selected only 50. What are the total, uh, the total in museum are uh, in exhibition, uh, 1,300, but in the museum, only paintings around 9,000. Elizabeth, I don't associate Spain with Impressionism. Are there a lot of Impressionist works in the museum? Not really. Uh, that was a movement not very famous, uh, popular in Spain. And in the museum, we only have a few of them, mainly Sorollas. The most striking feature from the paintings is how the beauty standards for women have changed so much in the recent time. That is really true. If you see Rubens, for instance, with the three graces. Andrew, I was, a last, I was last at the Prado in 1995 in a huge rainstorm. Oh. <laughs> I saw water dripping down from the ceiling of a Velázquez painting. Is the gallery being better looked after now? Yeah, there was a very intensive um, restoration work of the museum in the last decade, so now it's a very good condition. Also with the enlargement that happened in 2007 and the one they are going to have in the next year. Candice, uh, how long is the exhibition on, or when does, this, when does this show close? It wasn't able to be till the 13th of September, so yesterday, but it's gonna be uh, extended to till October or November, I think the middle of October. And Ludmila says, how did your paintings to the Prado. 
uh, it uh, was an exquisition from the royal family, okay, like as many of the royal collection. Kelly, did you say that in the still life by Peters that she painted her reflection? Yes, in, in, in the shiny uh, um, little uh, jars and, and, and pieces, she painted her reflection in the small uh, rounded pieces, okay? It's, you need to get closer, but you could see it. Jamie, are there modern artworks in the museum? Uh, if not, what museum? Thank you for the tour, it was wonderful. Not really, uh, the artwork are still the end of the 19th century, early 20th century. The modern collection of Spanish art, uh, the Spanish uh, modern collection are in the uh, Reina Sofia Museum, also in this same area, in the Prado Promenade. Lastly, and the simmering, the simmering of the light was more important to Soroya in the painting of the boys at the beach. Yes, he was a master using the light, in particular the light from the Mediterranean. Catherine, thank you, Manuel. I was 17 in 1969 when I visited El Prado. Your tour made me gap when I saw many of the paintings. I remember seeing way, seeing way back then. You are a wonderful guy. Thank you so much, Catherine. Claudia, was this another insider secret like the story you talked about the dog barking right before another visit? I was, I was witness of that. It was really scary. Okay, well, um, uh, there's a beautiful book about that kind of secrets. Uh, it's called, uh, oh, okay, maybe, I don't remember now, but maybe through Mara, uh, you could send, send an email and I will send you the link to the books because it's really interesting with a lot of secrets around, around the brother. Joyce, in the painting with the spinning wheel, do you know if they were spinning wool or cotton? Mm, I'm not sure, but certainly uh, I think it was wool at that time. Samina, Manuel, Oof, this is French. My French is really not good. Je vous remercie pour ce tour magnifique du Musée Prado. Je vous remercie de votre temps. J'espère que nous allons vous passer de vous revoir pour un temps. OK, she is just uh, uh, giving me thanks for the mission. Thank you. Sir. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Terence, the Garden of Early Delights. Is this on exhibit at Prado as the three panels as part of the exhibit? How big is this piece? It's not in this exhibition, but I consider one of the masterpieces and one of my favorite uh, 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 paintings. So that's why I include it. It's really big. I will say that probably seven per 11, something like that, a feet. Marta. With Soroya paintings in New York, Eastern Spain, and his museum in Madrid, are there many Soroya del Prado? In the Prado, there are not many, but you could see a lot of them on Soroya's museum, which is located in Madrid. It's a museum just dedicated to Soroya with magnificent um, uh, pieces from him. Susan, is there any meaning attached to the presence of the dog in the very center of the washing of the feet? Well, what? Probably uh, 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 it's a faithful animal, probably is the meaning. Uh, I'm not that expert on that painting, but probably it could be something like that. Hazel, clarity of the colors in so many of these other paintings is amazing. Well, some of them, they were really restored in a very good way. The Prado has one of the most important workshops uh, according to restoration in the world. Okay, so that's why. Janie. I'm watching from Washington DC in the United States. Thank you so much for putting this tour together. I look forward to visiting Madrid and the Prado Museum soon. You will be welcome to Madrid and to Spain anytime. Cheryl, oh, my friend Cheryl. Well done, Manuel. Definitely brought back great memory on the last, of the last time I was in the Prado, doing your scavenger hunt. That was a funny scavenger hunt. Thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you so much, it was my pleasure sharing with you and all, all of you. Uh, David, do you also give tours of the Reina Museum, uh, the Reina Sofia, sorry? How will you compare the Reina Sofia to the Prado? Yes, I was working in both the Prado and the Reina Sofia and I, will, uh, I used to do some tours inside the museum. Well, there are two different museums. Uh, the Reina Sofia is contemporary, contemporary art uh, of the 20th century. Eh? We have Dalí, we have Picasso, we have Juan Gris, we have many other European and American artists, so it's different uh, from the Prado in a way uh, because of the, the, the type of art. Can you please repeat the legend around the Red Cross in, the, in Las Marinas? 
Okay, that legend uh, is about, you know, the, the order of the Knights of St. James. So it says, uh, so the, 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 the title of being Knight of St. James was given to Velázquez after his death. So Velázquez wasn't, uh, he, 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 he didn't paint it, okay? So that's, the, le the legend says that the King Philip IV paint, painted the cross uh, uh, after Velázquez's death. Arlene, how is Madrid doing with COVID cases and following mass and social distancing guidelines? Well, we are doing bad nowadays. Uh, uh, we are having an, uh, many, many, uh, an increase of cases, you know, day after day, but the difference with the first wave is now we have uh, uh, affected you know younger people so still we are containing containing uh, containing the, 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 the you know the, the pandemic in a way we are respecting uh, a lot the, the using the max most of the people on the street they are using the max we are following the distance but not everyone uh, and so that's why we are having cases terence the two Saturn's paintings, very interesting, how similar. Thank you for showing them together. Yeah, I, I, I found them very, very interesting, the idea of putting together. Santiago, Santiago, yes, come to Santiago de Compostela anytime. And finally, Karen, uh, nobody will ever know that this is the first virtual tour compiled and presented. <laughs> but honestly, it was my first one. I was kind of nervous in a way. Truly magnificently, magnificently and exceptionally professionally done. Thank you so much, Karen. That I really appreciate that comment. Okay, and so Manuel, you got through the entire Q and A. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, for staying online, and thank you so much, Manuel. I mean, uh, obviously, without the attendees, this would be nothing for Manuel. But um, with the attendees, Manuel is able to touch so many people that he's not able to touch during the tour season. So we really appreciate both. Um, if you have additional questions, please feel free to message me or email me and I will do my best to coordinate answers. Um, I just put up a slide of our future virtual tours. So if you are interested in more tours um, like this and seeing other regions, by all means, log on to my website and Thank sign up for email. additional tours. Um, and, and like I said, I, I think all good things must come to an end and, and this is the end for us. So I want to take a special time and thank you, Manuel, for everything you've done and thank you attendees. And we are going to uh, end this. So whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner time for all of you, <laughs> go and enjoy some, some, something that you have up next. Take care and have a great night, morning, and afternoon. Thank you, Mara. It was my pleasure, you know, giving you this tour to everyone. Bye. And I, I wait for you in Madrid, in Spain. Come to visit us. Okay. Bye-bye.